Hello, Malcolm here. Delighted to share with you some ideas today in our latest series called A New Challenge. This is part five, and it's about the challenge of staying true to our mission. To our mission, and stay tuned in case you think you already know what I'm going to talk about, because maybe I have an angle on this or some ideas about this that might might be a bit different, might be refreshing. I hope so. So as you know, in Thames Valley, if you're a member of the church, uh, we are having quite a few changes at the moment. Changes in our leadership team, shepherding structure, staffing, the board, small groups, all, all kinds of things. And whilst none of those changes are exactly earth shattering, they do bring new challenges. And one of those challenges is this, that while these things around us might be changing somewhat, there is a challenge to stay spiritually focused whilst other things are settling down. It's important to bear in mind what Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 11, when he said, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That's a challenge in itself, of course. But if Paul is challenging the Romans with that, and they were going through a difficult time, look at the background of the book of Romans sometime, it must be possible. So Paul isn't asking them to do something they could not do. And when that applies to us, keeping our spiritual firm and not lacking in zeal, it means it's something we can do. We need to figure out how. And I hope some of the things I'm going to share today will help us with this. Not so much personally, although that's part of it, but more in terms of our groups, our faith groups, our small group, our family group, our location, whatever your group is. My prayer is that these thoughts will help you to keep that sense of spiritual fervor in your group, no matter what else is going on. So the key thought for today is this. If we're going to keep our spiritual fervor, we have to do something. We have to do this. We have to learn how to distinguish between our shadow mission and our true mission. We learn to distinguish between our shadow mission and our true mission. I will explain. So what is a shadow mission, you may well ask? Well, I'm taking this term from a superb little book that I thoroughly recommend called Overcoming Your Shadow Mission by John Ortberg. Overcoming Your Shadow Mission. He defines a shadow mission, let me read here for you, as a distorted version of one's true mission or calling, shaped by selfishness, fear, or hidden motives. It's, it's what happens when you take the unique strengths, desires, and talents that God has given you, but use them for purposes contrary to God's will and your highest calling. That he's applying to individuals, but I'm applying this to groups. Your group has unique strengths, desires, talents. God's given them to you, but sometimes, if you're in a group like I've often been in groups, sometimes those strengths, desires, and talents are not used for God's highest calling on us. Sometimes they can be used just to create a kind of Christianity that we like, that we find comfortable, that satisfies us. And that is a shadow mission. Ortberg goes on to explain in his book that every person, and I think it's true of every group, that they have a true mission, one that reflects God's purpose for their life, although there is then this shadow mission alongside. And that's driven by ego, it's driven by insecurities, it's driven by distractions. It's often quite a subtle deviation from the good you were meant to pursue, disguised as something appealing or a bit easier. Think about Jesus in the desert, tempted by Satan. While the true mission leads to serving others, that's one way you can recognize it, serving others and living out one's purpose, the shadow mission leads to self-serving behaviors. What's in it for me? And decisions that take people away from their best selves. So a key idea in the book is that we must recognize our shadow mission, learning how to recognize it and notice it when it looms its ugly head so that we can resist it and live according to God's true calling on us, in our group, in Thames Valley, or wherever you are. So, a few things to think about uh, that will help. Firstly, if we're going to recognize our shadow mission, we have to clarify our true mission first. <laughs> 
So how do we clarify our true mission as a group, your group, not everybody else's group, just your group? What's your true mission for your group? Well, you could conduct a simple but profound exercise. Gather with your group and ask yourselves what your mission is as a ministry. What mission has God given you? That's your group in the place where you are at this present time. Might change in six months. And by the way, I'm using the word mission here in its general sense, not in the narrow sense of evangelism only, because mission is much more broad than just evangelism, though evangelism is certainly part of it and a very important part, vital part. When you can articulate your true mission for your group, then you will notice when you're off track from that. And it will be easier to call each other back to what you've already decided, what you've already recognized as God having given you that mission. So how do you discover this true mission? My suggestion, one way, is to read the Sermon on the Mount together. Read it together, perhaps read it personally and everybody in your group read it, then come together to discuss it together. Because in that teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus summarizes his kingdom's concerns and priorities. What an amazing passage of scripture it is. So after you've read it and prayed about it and you come together, then discuss it together. What would it look like? What would it look like for your group to live out the teachings of this incredible sermon? And then write down what you find. Discuss, pray, write it down. Condense it into a few core values and principles. Then having done that, work out what the practicals are for you at this time as a group. For you to live out the Sermon on the Mount. I think that'll clarify what your mission is. What your true mission is. Then let's think about this shadow mission idea for a bit, shall we? It has to be said, all groups get off course from time to time. Yours would be no different to anybody else's. It happened to the churches in the first century, didn't it? That's why we have so many of the epistles from Paul and other writers. It is an all too human tendency to reshape things into our own benefit and Christians are not immune from this. It is tempting to make Christianity fit our preferences, mine and yours. So periodically, it's good to review what you discovered when you clarified your true mission and ask one another whether you are still on course. And if, or rather perhaps when, you notice your group veering off course from its true mission, then we need to do something. So what do we do? Well, there's many things we could do, but I'm going to offer you three things you can do when you notice the shadow mission is beginning to influence you too much. The first thing you may want to do is embrace the most painful issue in your group. Embrace the most painful issue in your group. Figure out what you're avoiding dealing with in your group. That's likely to be the most painful thing, but what is that thing? What are you avoiding? Is there perhaps conflict in the group that needs resolving? Is there sin in the group that needs addressing? Are double standards being tolerated or half-heartedness left unchallenged in the group? Are some of the marriages in a bad state? What about the parenting, if you've got children parenting in your group? I mean, is it, is it healthy? Is it Christ-like? Is it loving? Is depth lacking in your group? If you've only just formed your group, that would be natural. But if you've been together two or three years, is depth lacking in the relationships? Does the group perhaps enjoy hanging out together, but not so much praying together or talking deeply about scripture together? You see, whatever is being avoided is probably the most painful issue, and that is where you need to go. Now approach the topic, whatever it is, with sensitivity, with prayer, with a lack of judgment, and with patience, but do not run from it. Jesus never did. He embraced the conflict that was necessary to help people stay on the narrow road with him, following as his disciples. Reread the sermons to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, perhaps. They are not harsh. They're not negatively judgmental. They are loving. 
God is attempting to help the members of those churches return to a full and intimate relationship with him. So the first thing to do is to embrace the most painful issue. The second thing is to speak candidly to one another about what we observe. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 25, Paul says, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Speak the truth to one another. Let me ask you this. Do you remember Esther in the Old Testament? Remember her story, Esther Mordecai? Uh, she's the one taken into the, the king's harem. She ends up being the queen. She's in a tough spot. She's a Jew in a pagan culture, and the rest of her Jewish compatriots are under threat. Their lives are under threat. And Mordecai tells her, her, her relative, that she needs to talk to the king to deal with this, to, to rescue the rest of the Jewish people. She needed to talk to the king, but she was, how was she feeling? Um, afraid. And for good reason, if you know the story. You go back and have a look at it in Esther. But Mordecai knew that if she refused to do this, to speak up, the consequences would be dire. In Esther 4 verse 14, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai knows she is the one to speak up. In our groups, we have to speak up in our groups, doing it kindly and lovingly and patiently, but we must speak up. Because if your group falls apart and spiritually dies, God will raise up some other people. But the consequences for you and your group will be dire. Why allow that to happen? Now, good news is that Esther heeded Mordecai's candor and she saved a nation. So the question is, who's the Mordecai in your group? Could you be the Mordecai in your group? Who loves the group enough and loves each other enough to challenge each other when we're ready to settle for the shadow mission? Ortberg says in his book, let's help each other to be more devoted to our true mission than our more comfortable shadow mission. So let's speak candidly to one another. And thirdly and finally, what do we do when we feel that sense of the shadow mission uh, dominating, taking over? Thirdly, we beseech God for his help. We cannot do this without him. God is more willing to help us than we might actually realize. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, I love, I mean, I love this uh, promise that we have here in Hebrews 4, where it says, let us then approach God's throne uh, of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Uh, in his book called Grace, Max Licardo writes, Sustaining grace promises not the absence of struggle, but the presence of God. If God permits the challenge, he will provide the grace to meet it. God has the grace your group needs. So when we go to God, we look to him for his help. We do find that help, but we're also reconnected more powerfully with God himself. In another one of his books, Max Licardo writes, it's in the book Fearless, he says, we aren't oblivious to the overwhelming challenges that life brings. We're to counterbalance them with long looks at God's accomplishments. Yes, your group may have a challenge. Yes, your group may be struggling with elements of the shadow mission. But look, look intently at God. Look, what does he say? Uh, looking at God's accomplishments, long looks at God's accomplishments. Look at his accomplishments and who he is, and he will give you the strength and courage to overcome the challenges for your group. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 we must pay more close attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. That's the promise. We have the strength of God so that we don't drift. So here's a question. What is your group's mission? Your group's mission. Don't worry about anybody else's group. What's your group's true mission? And what does the shadow mission look like? The comfortable mission look like? 
Identify those two and that'll help you. So explore your true mission. Examine whether you are living that mission and then encourage one another towards repentance where necessary. Now, next time, we're going to move on to our final theme of the year, the final quarter, October, November, December are soon coming. We're going to move on to a new theme and that theme will be a new... No, I'm not going to tell you just yet. I'll keep you in suspense, but it's going to be a new something else coming soon. Watch this space. Hope you find these thoughts helpful. Do drop me a line if you be uh, if you have any questions or thoughts about all this. And by the way, I'd like to encourage you to participate in the AIM UK and Ireland program because you'll find deeper teaching there that I think will help you and your group to deepen in its faith and its ability to carry out the true mission that God has given you. To the next time, take care and God bless.